Hi everyone. I welcome you all to our time of worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am very glad that you are able to tune in today on this All Saints Sunday, a day when we remember and celebrate the work of the people of faith who have gone before us and be reminded of the kingdom living that we are called to as saints and people of faith today. But before we approach God in worship, I want to share a few announcements with you all. And so you might have noticed that the newsletter and the November calendar arrived in your inbox on Friday, and they have been mailed out to those who are offline along with the sermon copies. You'll see right now the November calendar displaying on the screen as there are a few ways to get involved in the life of our congregation this week. And so on Monday, November 2nd at 7 o'clock, we will have virtual youth group. And so youth group will be meeting on social media messenger so that we can connect and play games together. And so if you are in grade 6 to 12 or know of anyone who would like to join our social media group, then please reach out to me via email. On Tuesday at 1 p.m., Tuesday, November 3rd at 1 p.m., I will be leading the Living the Word group on Zoom. And so all are welcome to join in that. And the link has been circulated in the newsletter. And it will always be the same link. So you can feel free to save it if you'd like to easily join in Living the Word group on Tuesday. And then even though we are moving into code red restrictions here in Winnipeg, we are, it is my understanding that we can still have a 15% capacity limit for faith-based gatherings. And so we will continue with morning prayer Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. and Dave's Bible study Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. for those who have a deep desire for in-person community. But we do just ask that you please call ahead to reserve your spot. It is really important during this time to help us manage our numbers and also so that we know to reach out to you in case there are any changes in these programs. But I do hope to see you at one of our uh, gatherings, whether in person or virtual, this week. We come before God on this All Saints Sunday to be reminded of this kingdom living that we are called to as we seek to continue the ministry of Jesus and the many saints who have gone before us, who now rest from their earthly labors. As we are reminded together of the ways of being that we are called to, let us approach God in adoration and confession. Let us pray. Creator, Christ and Spirit, we gather together virtually on this day because you alone are worthy of our praise. You offer your redeeming love to every soul in every situation. So it is our greatest joy to be united by your spirit in the community of your people, stretching throughout the generations all around the world you love. We join our thanks and praise to the voices of all your saints, both in heaven and on earth, who worship and adore you. For all blessing and glory, all wisdom and thanksgiving, all honor and power belong to you, O God, this day and forever and ever. It is not because we fear you, O God, but because we love you and trust in your loving kindness that we confess our sins to you. God of courage and commitment, we confess that we have not always followed the path you have set before us. Discomfort and fear hold us back from fully embracing your gift of new life. Our anxieties prevent us from bearing witness to your love. Forgive us, O oh God. Give us courage that we may be your saints in our own time, faithfully following Jesus no matter the cost. Amen. My friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. 
The old life is fading away and a new life is coming to be. Know that you are forgiven and through the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit, you have the power to forgive one another. Thanks be to God for his goodness and mercy to us. Amen. from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In our reading today from the Gospel of Matthew, we hear the beginning of what is commonly referred to as Jesus' great sermon on the mount, or more specifically, the Beatitudes. Jesus has just begun his journey with his disciples, healing the sick and proclaiming the good news. In our passage today, we hear some of this good news from Jesus. This good news invites us into a new kind of life, the kingdom life. It helps us to begin to comprehend what good kingdom living looks like and the possibilities that we can bring about in this world God has made. Commentator William Barclay describes this passage as the opening of Jesus' whole mind to his disciples, the summary of the teaching which Jesus habitually gave to his inner circle. These Beatitudes form the code of ethics for Jesus' disciples and all who seek to follow him. They are the intentions of God's heart and Jesus' mind put to words. These are the expectations of the Old Testament, revealing themselves in the new kingdom that Jesus is bringing about, the kingdom that we are commissioned to carry on. In giving the Beatitudes, Jesus is trying to help us imagine what life looks like when we live according to God's will. In the beginning of his sermon, Jesus tells us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, those who thirst and hunger for righteousness, the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted on Christ's behalf. Jesus goes on even still. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of my name. Jesus offers us quite a list, one that isn't initially easy to hear or even accept like Jesus so often does, he is turning the societal values and norms around him upside down as he proclaims the new ways of this new kingdom that is coming near. But there are promises within these beatitudes. The first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven for example, teaches us that the presence of God in human flesh, Jesus, is a true and lasting blessing for us all. And through him and the gift of the Holy Spirit, God will give us all that we need when we seek his will and live in this kingdom way. This passage invites us to stretch our notions of what God's presence among us really means. Notice how God doesn't promise to remove our grief or the many other earthly things that cause us pain, but rather he promises to transform it in such a way that we see in the resurrected Christ the promise 
that God's love is more powerful than death. Yes, we will face difficulties in this life, but God will comfort us and grant us the kingdom of heaven when we suffer as a result of his will. This passage also invites us into transformation. These beatitudes Jesus offers encourages us to look at those around us differently than our culture does. It invites us to transform our sense of where God is at work in the world, to see that God shows up where we least expect God to be. You see, God isn't just in places of strength and power, but in places of great vulnerability. God is working amid our grief, alongside those who exercise mercy and work for righteousness. And in so many other activities, the world considers not just meek, but weak. As pastor and professor David Louse has said, the God we know in Jesus always shows up where we least expect God to be, in a feeding trough in a stable, rather than in a jeweled crib in a palace, among the poor and destitute, rather than with the rich and powerful, and on the cross of an outlaw, rather than astride the war horse of a conquering hero. God does not show up in our attempts for worldly power and success. Rather, he shows up in our acts of sacrifice and mercy. What's more is that Jesus points us to recognize that God's kingdom isn't a place far away, but it is found wherever we honor each other as God's children, whenever we bear each other's burdens, bind each other's wounds, and meet each other's needs. When we work for justice, where injustice persists, God is at work, blessing, sustaining and supporting his beloved children and this world he has made. There is no act of kingdom living that is too small. Now these beatitudes aren't just helpful hints for happy living. It is not a to-do list with boxes to check. In fact, that very idea could lead us to terror rather than reassurance. And that's what this passage is meant to be. Reassurance that God's kingdom is coming about in this world. And reassurance that we can help bring it about. These are the kingdom values that reveal what kingdom living is like. We can bring this kingdom about in our world. Psychological theory has proven time and time again that humans pursue what speaks to the core of our being. So, the longer we gaze at God and really revel in his goodness and promises, the more and more we will all hunger for that goodness to be brought about in this world. God, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, has distributed skills, talents, and spiritual gifts among all of his people. As we grow in these spiritual gifts, we are pursuing what speaks to the core of our being. And as we offer our gifts to the world, allowing God to work through us, we are helping him to bring about his kingdom 
which he desperately desires for this world. My friends, God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom is coming near. We just don't always see it. Our world is a messy place right now, to say the least. And this messiness can easily distract us from the good things that God is doing as he brings about his kingdom in our world. When we do see the kingdom coming about, when we wander into kingdom moments in this earthly life, we need to take a moment to stop and really recognize them. We need to look at the context and the preconditions that have created these kingdom moments. Then, we need to try to practice getting to those kingdom moments more and more. Jesus is giving us a way forward in our messy world through these Beatitudes which we have heard today. Jesus even gives us an example to live by through the way he has lived out his life in his earthly ministry. And thanks be to God for that, because there are many leaders and people in our world working against this way of kingdom living in our world. But we are so lucky that we have the gift of these Beatitudes, which help to shape and form our lives as we live into the way that God intends for us. They call us to engage the world in a different way, in Jesus' way, as we bring about his kingdom here together. And that's the good news, that we don't do it alone. We don't have to bring this kingdom about alone. Rather, we do it together with the gifts that the Spirit has given to each of us, and we do it through the strength of Christ. The Beatitudes require us to be fully dependent on God. Yes, there will be grief in this life. Yes, human power will be abused, leaving some to be powerless. If we are going to take up this kind of kingdom living, if we are going to be peacemakers and be a merciful presence, we need God's peace and mercy to be working through us. We have to be willing to make room and give up things so that God's will can really be working through our lives. We can't do any of this. We can't bring about God's kingdom in this world without God working through us. Because we are a part of something so much greater than just ourselves. When we are pure in heart, God is with us and loving us all the time. When we live in a way that is pleasing to him, we are living in such a way where we can truly see his presence and goodness while we plant seeds of his kingdom in this world. These ethical instructions might challenge our own notions, to be sure. Jesus calls many conditions we seek to avoid as blessed. We also might fall victim to associating blessings with material gain. But Jesus' words in our passage today stretch our imagination to see God present and at work in so many other and often countercultural ways, particularly in our service to others, but also in the dark and difficult parts of life. At the end of our passage, Jesus reminds us that this is the life 
that many of Christ's disciples were willing to be persecuted for. A soothing reminder on this All Saints Sunday. This kingdom life is not an easy road. When we take this road with Christ, we can't expect success according to the measures of this world. You may or you may not see your reward on earth for this work you are doing in bringing about God's kingdom. But when we live in this kingdom way, we can bring about the future that we desire for this world God has made. And it is also a future that God desires for all of his beloved children. And so, let us live according to God's kingdom ethic. But even more so, let us allow God's kingdom promises to transform our thoughts words, and deeds. In this effort, we are joined, joined to ourselves, to each other, and to God, to all the saints across the centuries, redeemed by the grace of God that we know in Jesus. My friends, may we work together to bring about a kingdom world where there is no stranger and no outcast. Let us bless what the world refuses to bless. Let us love what is viewed as unlovable. Let us be different from the world around us, just as God has intended, being places of forgiveness, mercy, grace, and hope. Jesus, you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. 
We pray for people and communities facing famine and drought on top of this global pandemic. Give strength to people and agencies dedicated to alleviating misery of any kind. Move us to share what we have with those who have so much less. Christ, you blessed the peacemakers. We pray for those who work for peace and reconciliation in this ever divided world. Protect those who face violence, persecution, and chaos in their homes, workplaces, or communities. Transform the day-to-day -day struggles of those living in danger or discord. May you guide the leaders of all nations in this world, and move us all to serve as mediators and models of forgiveness in our relationships. Jesus, you bless those who weep. We pray for those around the world and in our community who are dying, and for those who weep for their loved ones who now rest from their labors. On this day, we specifically think of the family of the late Pearl Jones and ask that you fill them with your peace, which surpasses all understanding. We name in silence now those on our hearts this day, including those saints who have blessed us in the days and years gone by. Keep us united in love with all those around us and with all who rest from life in this world but live with you. O oh Jesus, with your followers in every generation, we join together now, praying the words you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as we go out into the world, joining people of faith, both past and present, in bringing God's kingdom about in this world, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and forever. Amen.